যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না আসে তবে একলা চলো রে ছি <laughs> I told her how he pined and ah, the deep, the low, the pleading tone with which I sang another's love, interpreted my own. Love by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And this is the theme of this session, Chasing Love Festival, Forbidden Territory. From Adam and Eve, the saga of forbidden love has unfurled and time and again we find it in art, popular culture, literature, and yes, also amongst us, somewhere hidden in plain sight. This boutique festival is brought to you by Prabhakitan Foundation, a name synonym to socio-cultural welfare for over 40 years. In this interesting segment, we have with us Ms. Anukriti Upadhyay. Anukriti has postgraduate degrees in management and literature and a graduate degree in law. She writes in both English and Hindi. She stunned readers and critics alike with the twin novellas, Dora and Bhanuri in 2019, and her delighted Hindi readers with short story collection, Japani Sarai. We also have with us Ms. Janvi Barua. Janvi is an Indian writer based in Bangalore. Next door, her debut collection of short stories was long listed for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. Her next, a novel called Rebirth, was shortlisted for the Man Asian Literary Prize and the Commonwealth Writers Prize. The third, Under Tau, a novel was published in February 2020 and was long listed for the JCB Prize for Literature 2020 and the BLF Atagalata Book Prize 2020. It won the Best Friction Fiction Prize in the Author Award 2021. Her short f- fiction has been widely anthologized and her work is part of several university syllabi. Janvi studied medicine but is not a practicing doctor. She was born in Guwahati and raised between Assam, Meghalaya, Delhi and Manchester. Joining them, we have Miss Madhvi Menon, 
Madhvi is a professor of English at Ashoka University and writes on desire and queer theory. She is the author of Wanton Words, Rhetoric and Sexuality in English Renaissance Drama, Unhistorically Shakespeare, Queer Theory in Shakespeare in Literature and Film, and Indifference to Difference on Queer Universalism. She is also the editor of Shakespeare, a queer companion to the complete works of Shakespeare. Last but not the least, we have Miss Nandita Bose. Nandita is an Indian film actress and has done prominent lead roles in Malayalam, Tamil, Hindi and Bengali films. She is well noted for her performance in Malayali movies. She has received Filmfare Award for the Best Actress for her movie Sampan. In conversation with these powerful ladies is Ms. Madhvi S. Mahadevan. Madhvi is an award-winning author of children's books. Her debut novel, The Kuntiyas, is a retelling of Mahabharat from the perspective of Kunti. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to have you all here for this evening's talk on an important aspect of human relationships, perhaps the most important aspect, which is both a holy grail as well as a forbidden territory. Uh, true love is what I'm talking about, what it promises, intimacy, passion, commitment. However, the quest to this holy grail is full of obstacles. And one of the hurdles that uh, writers and artists face is, comes in the form of the obscenity law, under which acts or words in the public domain that cause annoyance to others are punishable. And uh, as I said, writers have, and artists have to bear the brunt. For instance, in 1967, there was uh, a, a book published by a very renowned Bengali writer, Buddhadev Bose, called It Rained All Night. This book was banned. Fortunately, the Supreme Court overruled the ban. And today it is read and appreciated for its deep psychological insights into the issue of infidelity. In fact, readers today would have to probably scratch their heads to um, sort of ask and ask, where does the obscenity law even apply to this book? Because the one word which might sort of titillate is about is the word breasts. You see it in passing. That's, a, that's all. It would therefore seem that we've come a long way since that time because we are now in an age when love stories are getting increasingly messy and we love to watch them. There are films like Gili Puchli, Puchi, Puchi, Gili Puchi about caste and sexuality. Uh, or there is the award-winning Assamese film Amis, which stretches the definition of what is normal in love to its extreme limit. So uh, is love still a forbidden territory? We'll begin the discussion by, uh, by a question which is for all you authors. And that is that the best love stories that we know from The Little Mermaid, which we hear in childhood, to the classics like Romeo, Juliet, and Anna Karenina, Sohini Mahiwal, He Ranja, are about the power of love and how it makes lovers cross lines. Invariably, there is retribution. And the stories never get happily ever after endings. However, as audiences, we love them. We love these tales of star-crossed lovers. Why is that so? Who would like to go first? Let's go alphabetical and push it to Anukriti. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Anukriti. <laughs> Uh, since uh, Nandita has put me on the spot right at the beginning, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I have often wondered why we take such pleasure in um, in in um, sad stories. Maybe it is because they are a story. It takes a bit of the sting out of the sadness, out of the tragedy. While we are reading, we are immersed in the book, but. We also um, we, we are also aware <clears throat> that this is somebody's imagination playing out. Um, 
perhaps also sadness is comforting because our lives are full of small big um sadnesses you know the it, it, our our birth is linked to our death mortality um it, it touches us the moment we are out of the womb and sometimes uh, unfortunately also before that so we our existences are you know entwined with some pain or sadness at all times perhaps that part of our consciousness the consciousness that um it, it, that that embraces the sadness and thus enables us to function and live um and continue to also taste happiness so not be um you know drowned in a sorrow perhaps that part of our consciousness um is attracted to these sad stories uh, and of course the other aspect of it is that um romance is interesting it's intriguing it incites curiosity however the the sequel to <laughs> romance uh perhaps does not excite curiosity as much uh, it's perhaps not so interesting all um happy endings um tend to have follow a pattern uh, whereas all tragedies are uh, you unique. know somehow unique yes yeah. so um yeah but this is a question i i always ask myself um not that there are not happy stories i mean in my own uh, i i belong to rajasthan and in my own culture there are happy stories uh dhola maru being one uh where the two lovers unite um and in many ways uh, ratan singh padmavati is uh, which became in famous due to the movie padmavat uh, is also a happy love story the lovers do unite of course they are parted uh, because of um, a war or political reasons but they do unite so i i guess what i'm trying to say is there are um, in in indian culture we do find happy um happy endings for love stories but we just remember the sad ones the tragic ones uh, more they just appeal to that conscious that un, that side of our consciousness which embraces tragedies which wants to protect them which brings out all the uh, good instincts in us and yeah. but i'm very curious to know what others say you know, what yeah. is it thank you i think uh, next would be on uh, janvi okay Mm-hmm. alphabetically yes yeah uh, i i i i do agree with anukriti when she says that um, sometimes happiness can be boring um if not boring at least very uh, common place it's something which is uh, doesn't evoke once it's fulfilled once you've achieved happiness uh, i don't know that somebody else would resonate with you so much i mean what more what else is there to see right so um yeah i think that the path to happiness is what interests us and um it it, it interests us more if it is um, full of danger full of challenges full of obstacles and we um sort of do the roller coaster ride with the protagonist and that's what excites us what thrills once one is happy end of story we um i don't know when when she said sequel to happiness did she say did she mean marriage perhaps all that gets very boring <laughs> beyond that <laughs> yeah and um whereas um grief i think sorrow um for a writer for an artist and even for the ordinary person even for the person who does not um, dabble in the arts is um, somewhere a deeper emotion and all of us uh, there is a truth in grief there is a purity in grief um there's very little pretense there's no posturing around grief you know a mother loses a child across the world just feels that same sharp stab uh, the 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 universality of grief i think is something we resonate to much more powerfully than that of say happiness or love um, that perhaps is enjoyed in different ways so i think when you um, watch a movie be it a romance be it um, uh, anything else and this grief involved i think we resonate at a very visceral level and um, that's where the great the great ballads the great stories the great um, epics lela majnu romeo juliet you know we we be thrilled to the fact that there um, there is grief involved and it does not all end happily ever after thank you nandita what about yourself i go next 
No, okay. I think um, so yeah, I think it's you who it should have been Madhvi Pas, but you go okay. ahead. Okay, I, I don't mind. <laughs> so, firstly, uh, welcome to our show. We are five women who are experts in the forbidden, and the fact that we are five women, we've been chosen quite carefully by our curator. But the important part is that this is our revenge for all the manals <laughs> that we have endured over and over and over <laughs> all our life. Um. <laughs> On a serious note, what is forbidden for men? I mean, men can beat their pregnant wives to death, and you know, still the fault will be hers that she served him bad tea or bad coffee, or you know, she never managed to tame his temper at all. So, uh, you know, for men, what when we are talking about forbidden, what is forbidden among genders differ? What is forbidden between? you know rural areas and urban areas differ what is forbidden in india is definitely not forbidden in in the us which is why a lot of you know um, nris want to come back when their children are in their teens so you know forbidden itself is a word that opens itself to examination to come to madhavi's question on uh, you know on star crossed lovers now what makes these lovers unsuitable for each other and that basically is that mm, you know uh, we are taught to otherize people who are not like us different income groups different castes different communities different languages that they speak all of them are the other and we are taught that you know there can be no commingling with the others and you know make no mistake even as romance writers you know we are perpetuating the you know the the common establishment so when you read love stories both of them are wealthy both of our or the guy is so wealthy that it doesn't matter you know all his negative uh, um traits like his anger and his you know womanizing etc cetera, etc cetera, can be written off because he has heaps of money so through love stories we actually teach people who you can love which is a profitable love uh, you know relationship and when we come to these sad stories you know these tragedies which end in death we are also being trained to know what happens when you defy the establishment you know and so there is very strongly through romance writers down the ages we are actually perpetuating what the establishment wants to establish as you know proper improper relationships in personal affairs yeah, yeah that's, thank that's you what i would yeah. say yeah yeah madhavi what about yourself thank you and thank you to anukruti janavi and nandita for such wonderful and impassioned uh, statements um I think I might be a little uh little more skeptical maybe a little less uh sentimental um I think what we recognize in these stories Madhvi that you mentioned yeah at the beginning over the Romeo and Juliet or he Ranja or Sony Mahiwal what we and by we I mean all of us lay people around the world what we recognize in these stories is that uh there is something to love that conduces much more to death than to a happily ever after that there's something about love that is much more attractive to us mm. in its guise of death rather than in its guise of sentimental happiness mm. um and and you know because if you say why is it that there are very very few romances i mean even uh, padmavat you know they they are not together at the end mm. why is it that there are so few stories in the world that end happily ever after and are of any interest to anybody and there are mm. no interest to people precisely because we look to literature i think mm. uh, to actually uh, allow ourselves to get in touch with what we all know about love but what we're encouraged to disacknowledge in regular life mm. so in regular life we're encouraged to sort of pay homage to love and how wonderful it is and how you know how crucial it is to our happiness but we all know better than that and that's why we turn to literature and to these specific literary texts yeah thank you that was uh, i mean there, there was a lot packed uh, in your answers to that very simple question you know and uh, i just loved all your answers i'd like to now get into the nitty gritty of your specific writings i'll start with you madhavi 
um, your book, uh, Infinite Variety, A History of Desire in India, explores the plurality of love. You mention that Kamdev, the god of love, is also known as Anang, which means bodiless, suggesting that desire is natural, fluid, disregards norms and forms. And it was given its proper place in ancient texts like the Kama Sutra and the Anangaranga. Today, however, the, that lack of clarity, which we find in these texts, which are fairly detailed and sometimes a bit boring, um, is missing. When, where, and with whom one engages in a sexual relationship is coming under a whole range of taboos. It's increasingly becoming controversial. If there was a time when a broader spectrum of sexual relationships was allowed in India, when did the process of sanitizing begin? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Madhvi. Um, I, I like the fact that you're sort of reversing the flow now, the alphabetical flow, which I was glad was interrupted because Nandita was asked to go before me. So I'm really glad that happened. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, Madhvi, as you know, um, since you know you you've read my book and you just announced its title, I don't speak about love. Um, I yeah. speak about desire. Okay. Love is not a concept I'm particularly fond of because as I think Nandita made very clear as well, but Janavi and Anukriti also referred to this. Uh, when we say love, we are talking about a sanitized, sanctioned, government approved version of what desire can be. Yeah. And so it inevitably has to take the form of a marriage, which has to be attested to by a certificate and so on and so forth. So love is an administrative fiction uh, that is then sort of enacted by people in, in sort of various shapes and guises um, and, and forms. I'm much more interested in desire precisely because I can't define it. Uh, no government is going to approve of my desire or not. Um, and nobody is going to give me a stamp of authenticity. Um, now, certainly there are, you know, sexual orientations that can be approved by governments or not, um, but they're all sort of, you know, they're always placed within frameworks of acceptability. So even with the decriminalization of 377, it is only if it is in private, for instance. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all acts of public sex are still going to be vilified. So um, any, any approved desire mm -hmm. is always going to be sanctioned and therefore a de sort of you know de-desirable or un made undesirable according mm. to me. Mm. Um, now this is not this is actually I mean and this is still a fiction, right? It's not as if people's desires suddenly vanish because the government tells them, okay, now you are married to so and so, and now you just have to love them for the rest of their lives. That does not happen, right? Which is why we had until very recently adultery laws. Uh, we have all the stuff about you know obscenity, and in fact, my new work on law, is it's called the law of desire, very much explores all these things that law cannot in fact make desire go away. Uh, what it can do is make various desires go underground, which might actually have the effect of making them more exciting rather than less. But certainly in the history of the Indic subcontinent, um, the, the British uh, colonizers used the tool of the law in order to bring certain desires under control. So for instance, um, men who dressed as women publicly were suddenly uh, sort of put into a tribe called the Criminal Tribes. And the Criminal Tribes Act was passed against them in 1871. Um, suddenly, um, women who did not want to get married, for instance, in various matrilineal societies, were criminalized and told them that they, you know, their property could not pass on to their children. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth in various realms of life. Uh, the British, because they were in the um, business of ruling over a population, rather than intermingling, which is what you know everybody from the Aryans onwards had done, mm. rather than intermingling with what's going on on the ground, because they wanted to rule from above, they had to create laws in which certain desires were sent underground or were made mm. subterranean. Mm. Um, and you know, when I was writing that book, I kept telling myself, I'm not going to blame the British for everything. Um, and, I, and I don't want to, because I think it's too simplistic to say, <clears throat> you know, X mm. is the reason for this. It's always much more complex and complicated than that. And one of the things I do want to point out is that there were very many traits um, 
certainly in what gets dis- understood as Vedic Hinduism, mm. that were very conducive to British colonialism, mm. prime among which was the caste system. caste system. Prime among which was this idea that, you know, uh, there's uncleanness and cleanliness. There is purity and there's danger. Um, mm. there, is, there are people you should not touch and there are people you should touch. There are people whose shadows should not fall upon the water that you drink. Mm. And so the British, you know, saw this and, and they saw the sort of, permissiveness that existed despite all these strictures. They saw the permissiveness that was exalted and celebrated by Sufi poetry, for instance. Uh, They saw the permissiveness that was sculpted in stone in uh, Kajuraho. And they sort of tried to steer this part of the world towards our more conservative tendencies and Mm. away from the more permissive ones. So Mm. it's not like they invented conservatism. They were just able to utilize what they found here because it conduced most fully to their worldview of utter and absolute prudence. Thank you. That was uh, really interesting. What I got from it was that it is the near past, the nearest past to us, which actually has a more direct, more powerful influence than the distant one. And uh, coming to the near past, I, my next question is for Janvi, uh, which uh, who explores um, the psychology of relationships in modern conventional family settings. Your latest novel, uh, Undertow, which is also an award winner, starts with a romance that is opposed by the girl's mother on grounds of sociocultural differences. However, Rukmini, the Assamese Hindu girl, does marry her Malayali Christian classmate, but eventually the couple grow apart. It's a marriage after all. Would you agree that frequently a forbidden relationship is an infatuation which is powered by family disapproval, which in turn sort of ensures that the relationship itself will not survive, either the death or the approval of the parent? In short, Is it true that no matter how much one believes in the, you know, idea of love, desire, transcending barriers in a marriage, cultural differences count? What would you like to say? Um, Thanks, Madhavi. I think I'd um, like to say that, no, I don't think one can generalize and say that cultural differences count. In fact, um, in Undertow, as you said, Rukmini is a Hindu girl marrying a Christian classmate and uh, her very dominating mother opposed that on the basis of that. But if you go back to my novel before that, Rebirth, again, a marriage which fails, is an arranged marriage between two Assamese people of the same caste. So I, I do think that, um, uh, maybe I'm being very naive here, but I do feel that love and marriage are quite agnostic of this. I mean, of course, pressures do come up. An intercommunity marriage will have different pressures from that uh, in the same community or caste. But I don't think that um, decides or really is the critical factor in deciding whether the marriage or the relationship will fail. So um, two books back to back in one a very same community, same caste, um, marriage completely fails. And um, in undertow, an inter, inter-community, inter-caste marriage fails all over again. So mm-hmm. I think there are different uh, drivers. I think that there are different um, criteria which um, contribute to uh, a relationship, not just a marriage, um, uh, you know, a, a long-term relationship. Mm. Once, uh, um, why, why they fail or they succeed? Oh, okay. I'll come back to rebirth and it's, you know, some of the things, themes that you've touched. But uh, before that, I'd like to move on to Nandita. Nandita, your, uh, in your novel Shadow and Soul, you have explored uh, one of the forbidden areas of love very beautifully. This is a relationship between an older man, older married woman and a younger man. And the focus is on the, you know, the awakening of passion. However, your writing all through the novel is very restrained and almost to the point of being chased. You know, you've also written erotica for Juggernaut, which as a genre, requires a much more explicit graphic writing style, given that the ingredients of all successful love stories are the same, you know, secrecy, sensuality, excitement, intrigue. How does a writer such as yourself balance the equation between evoking passion and showing, you know, action while writing about love? Wow. Okay, so... um... 
first let me trace the background you know for both both these uh, you know personas of you know me as a writer so when i wrote shadow and soul you know for the for about a decade before that i kept seeing you know my friends or people in my friend circle getting rid of their starter wives and you know at 40 at 50 very easily finding a 20 something for themselves hmm. and these women who were just abandoned by their husbands you know they were bringing up children on their own you know from from a you know a family of fairly well settledness they were out in the cold and trying to earn money you know and trying to start you know all over again and there is absolutely and you know if you look around in your circles there are just too many of you know single women single not because of their choice but but because their men you know sort of kind of use them and cast them away and our mm. society is quite okay with you know mm. not giving women a second chance which is when i talk you know when when i thought i conceived of this 36 year old woman who is slowly kind of disillusioned with her marriage and you know she comes across this 27 year old so there's a 9 year age difference she comes across this 27 year old artist and he becomes you know a very good friend now to come to to you know to me writing um to me writing erotica i have teen i mean at that point i had teenagers and i can't tell you before i hit the submit button how how hard i thought about it because i felt oh my god you know my my i have daughters they have friends you know so even you know despite being articulate and aware of the systems we are still cowed down by the system um to come down to how the writing goes you know for me being the eternal stupid romantic that i am for me it's my novels that are love stories and you know eroticas are short stories because i don't believe that you know erotica can be a full length novel i mean you have to be a very 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 talented writer to carry that on otherwise it just becomes a diary listing of men you've slept with or women you've slept with or whatever you've done you know all your sexual experiments it doesn't it, it's it's like a collation it's never a story whereas i feel that a lot you know and this is probably naive on my part but i feel there is tenderness there is you know there is a wanting companionship or commitment for the rest of your life to this person that under you know underlies um, your love stories and in this story you know the one that you mentioned shadow and soul the hero is very cognizant of the fact that you know she has a son who's a teenager and she has a husband and he cannot break up this family and you know when he realizes that she has kind of walked out but you know it's not like she's taken a you know taken a divorce or there are papers or anything she has just stepped back from the mainstream of her family life and it helps that her son has gone off to you know um, to study uh, medicine somewhere and her husband's also got transferred and then he realizes that you know what they have is you know is it's longer it's more enduring and he comes back to her and he has to then you know go past all the social restrictions and it was easier writing this because love stories you know you you carry people along you bring out the feelings the sentimentality the longing and you know you can stretch it out when i was writing erotica i look at all of our india and you know even the rape uh, you know um, calamity that we are facing i look at it you know in terms of all our garbled notions around sex you know mm. there is just so much of simmering underground lust in india it's a surprise that the country is you know uh, afloat so you know and it is a float because there are a large number of people in india who under the covers very 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 beautifully find exactly what they want you know and i have explored notions of incest i have explored notion of sex within the family with you know a father in law or a brother in law or whatever i have explored sex you know among gays among lesbians because i know that the norm that we are projecting in literature is not the norm at all you know and therefore my erotica you know though it is supposed to be brief and you know minimal um 
uh, I, I do believe that it captures life as it is. So, you know, romance is fantasy and erotica is raw and real, you know. And in terms of um, which do I prefer, you know, um, it doesn't matter what I prefer. Actually, my life is done almost. Um, but I don't see any precedence of this over the other. Like as a romance writer, I, would, I am supposed to say that it's, you know, romance is everything. A man who stays by you for the rest of your life. If it works for you to have 25 really hot partners all over your, you know, across your uh, youth, absolutely go for it. Don't let any old writer tell you this is right or this is wrong, you know. So both are valid in your journey and both are valid in what works for you as a person. Let no one else tell you what to do with your lust and your desire and your love. So I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, you have. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it, it sort of naturally leads to my next question, which is for... Um, Anukriti, you know, Anukriti, your novel, Kintsugi, the latest novel, is also a recent award winner. In this novel, you've explored relationships in foreign settings. In all these situations, sexual boundaries are porous and friends become lovers. For example, there is an Indian doctor who has a relationship with a female tourist in ja Jaipur. While the doctor's fiancé, who is studying in Japan, has an affair with a local woman there. All these liaisons are fleeting, but quite intense. My question is, were you aiming to capture the stark realism of the modern hookup culture, where that we get, that we take uh, what we get, where we get it, and with whom we get it? What would you like to say? Um, <clears throat> I... Uh... So while I was writing, I don't think I had the modern, um, the modern dysfunctions or modern realities in my mind. The stories, as you know, they come from another place and they go their own way. But when I look back at Kitsuki, uh, I do think that the aim was to um, was to put a spotlight, a focus on relationships which happen without any. Um, any emotional engagement or are fleeting, even if there's emotional engagement, you know, they are, they are short-lived. Um, all the relations in Kintsugi, um, it, it, they were, they happened because the protagonist or the person at the center of the, of that part of the novel had some um, gap or some disappointment or a hollow that they were trying to fill with this particular relationship. So um, Prakash, for example, the doctor in India who uh, has a, a, a fleeting sexual liaison with, uh, um, with Haruko, who is learning jewelry making in Jaipur, is, uh, it, that happens because he receives a very shocking bit of news and all his inhibitions following. And in a moment of um mm -hmm. you know clarity but mm -hmm. also clarity on one side about his own desire but on the other side utter confusion because everything he thought was real is now uh, is now disrupted at that moment he sought haruko for comfort Hmm. Um, whereas the other uh, relationship you mentioned between mina and yuri which is a same sex relationship was because of the um complete isolation and loneliness Mina certainly finds herself in because she's trying to break away and to rebel against a, a variety of things. So, um, so it, no, I wasn't trying to portray the, um, to, to, the, the um, short-lived or temporary relationships which are completely aimed at getting some kind of gratification. These were quite the opposite. They were trying to seek some kind of solution to a long standing, long festering issues issue inside them. And and I, I think that's how, why the relationships did not survive because the relationships are never a solution. Um, they are uh, they they might be 
a path to a solution, but they are never solution. They will never fill whatever hollow a person is nurturing. Um, and uh, I think that's what perhaps I was trying to say um, when I look back. Thank you. That's very interesting that relationships, which we think will take care of all our problems, give us that everlasting happiness, are not really the solutions to our deeper problems. Perhaps they are the reason, I mean, these problems are the reason why these relationships don't last. Janvi, you've kind of covered this in Rebirth, which is, uh, you know, uh, where, uh, where you talk about uh, couples, uh, you know, they forge relation. They forge relationships which then fail for some uh, fail to be sustained for whatever reason. And uh, there is a move on, you know, from that relationship. Um, you look for a deeper connection somewhere else. Like your, um, I think Kaveri's husband in in rebirth is, uh, you know, uh, is looking out for, is is having an affair. Now. Um, is it possible to recognize when the need for love, which is we all call it a human need, becomes toxic or self-destructive? And um, does this, does such a point come? You know, I, I had referred to Amis earlier, which examines the question of what is taboo in love. So my question to you is, how far should one go to keep the beloved happy? Thank you, Madhvi. Uh, that's a good question. And I think anybody in any relationship um, has at some point thought about this. Um, to what extent, to what uh, what line will you cross or not cross for love? And um, to your question, I think I would answer um, as far as is morally, legally, and reasonably allowed. Uh, you mentioned Amis where... Uh, um, it leads to a situation where they cross uh, taboo lines, very strongly drawn taboo lines in our society. And um, I, I think um, that probably wouldn't be advisable. But, and um, yes, in every relationship, you need to think it through and uh, decide how far you will go. But if you wish a relationship to succeed, I would say that um, you should and can go to the extent that is morally, legally, reasonably in your society allowed and permissible. Yeah, that's where that's that's a good answer. You know, I mean, I like the fact that you have to set the boundaries yourself. So there is a preservation of selfhood or something that is what you're talking about, uh, perhaps. And uh, it brings me to the. I'm rumbling up the order here completely. We are not going alphabetically. So I'll come back to you because you know it's directly connected with with what uh, uh, Janvi has just said. And this is for you, Anukriti. You know, uh, your no your novella Dora has, um, you know, is about the world of myths and folk tales colliding with the impersonal, soulless world of the government bureaucracy. And in the district, the, you have a character there who is a district collector who falls in love with the, or is fascinated by a mythical tree princess. Now, there is a quality of magic and mysticism, which is somewhat similar to the story of, say, Mirabai and her emotional connect with the god Krishna, which in its time was a forbidden love. So uh, ultimately, what is it that makes flesh and blood humans seek communion with unmatched, unlikely entities like tree princesses and gods? That's such an interesting question. It is really thought provoking, um, and uh, and I'm glad that you asked about Dora because I was thinking probably the question would be about body because that's more about the dark side of love, the twin um, or companion novel to to Dora. Um, but what makes people hanker after unreal entities? I mean, on one end of the spectrum, you referred to Mirabai and his and her um, love for Krishna, which. Um, broke every kind of uh, boundary. I mean, she had a very real flesh and blood husband, um, a, a whole culture of Rajput subjugation um, of women, of women uh, being viewed in a very patriarchal light. And it's still the reality in Rajasthan um, and in many other parts of India too, I'm sure. Uh, and for the district collector in Dora who also has a very real flesh and blood fiance in uh, somewhere. Um, 
what makes him um, uh, go, whether it's a hallucination or whether there's a real tree princess uh, that I, I still don't know. But what makes him fall head over heels with this unattainable perfection of uh, femininity, um, but also very cruel, who just denies um, to acknowledge his, who just does not acknowledge his love, makes him suffer a lot. Uh, and ultimately, whatever um, whatever union he achieves with her is probably all in his mind. I think the reason is because uh, we, we have unexpected, un, um, achievable expectations from the person we love. We want them to be perfect or and we want them to... Um, to read our minds, to be our soul twins, but at the same time be very different uh, so that they can remain interesting and mysterious. And that can never happen, except if you want to, you know, if you are hankering, pining for a tree princess, because tree princess will always be that. She will be perfect. And uh, you can imagine all sorts of um, uh, 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 beauty and intellect and um, art in her. Uh, so, so for men, you know, when men fell for these imaginary, um, imaginary love, lovers or love interests, I think it was a hankering for perfection. And when women did, for example, Mirabai, I always find her so fascinating, um, uh, because um, as a queen and someone who had a very public role um, assigned to her. Of, by the system at that time uh, and uh, an extremely constricted social existence. Uh, what made her go for Krishna was, I guess, the, you know, the same reason probably Andal went for her unachievable beloved. The desire for freedom, I think women have always desired freedom. We've always wanted not a man, but the freedom that perhaps accompanies the idea of um, love with an individual, believing that that love or that individual would set us free. Um, Mirabai was very wise. She knew that nobody will set her free. So she um, decided to love Krishna. Um, and the only person she could love without being accused of adultery, because if she loved a man, uh, she would probably have been killed. Uh, but she was free to love Krishna within certain limitations. So, yeah, I think men go for, I mean, I'm generalizing, obviously, and who am I? I'm no authority over love. But uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the, the district collector definitely loved the tree princess because she was unattainable and a figment of his imagination. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mirabai's passion was completely different. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's interesting that there has there has to be a quality of unattainable for love to sort of fuel itself or power itself. In uh, but Nandita, when it comes to your writing, your uh, the the stories that you write are usually about women in arranged marriages. The opposite one is told of love marriages in India. And the conflict usually starts with their realization of their being in a state of lovelessness. They seem to have lost connection with their spouse. The husbands are, you know, absor self-absorbed, indifferent to their wives and uh, expect them to play a supportive role lifelong. Uh, what is it about women in this situation that it needs the introduction of a third person, such as a lover, to help them break the mold that they kind of willingly sort of fitted into. You know, what is this lover who comes in young, old, same sex, whatever, actually provide? I mean, apart from sat the satisfaction of desire, what else does this lover provide? So, you know, the way I see the world and the way I see relationships and love, uh, you know, particularly in the context in which we are speaking of today, uh, there, you know, a woman lives, you know, life at various levels. So there is her inner world, then there is her outer world, which is reality. And then there is a third world, which has patriarchy and her, you know, the very little space that 
the community gives her. And it is monitored, you know, as uh, Madhavi has so beautifully said, even by succeeding governments, even by governments who've written their law in 1800 something, something, you know, uh, and all of that pertain to women and her world. And in, in, in my society, and I write about Bangla society, you know, Bangali society, I write about Bangali, uh, you know, a proper, uh, mm, girls who have been brought up, you know, um, to just be very good wives, because uh, if you don't get married in our society, it's like, you know, it's not only that you are doomed, but your family and your, you know, your brother's family and nobody's going to be happy. And, you know, you're the only attainable goal of your life is that you have to be married off. And what and my question is what happens to your daughter after she gets married off? And various things happen in cases the husband dies and the girl becomes a widow. And then there is this football between the, you know, the parents and the in-laws. You take her, no, no, you take her, you know? And so I try to, while I'm writing love stories, while I'm writing relationship stories, I try to do this little sneaky bit of like, look, look at yourself, look at where, where, where you bring, brought your women, where have you brought your daughters? And, you know, of course, there are cases where the husband is completely unsuitable, he's of the wrong temperament, he's of the wrong uh, age group, he's of, you know, there could be many kinds of gaps between the woman and the man, but a woman is not even allowed growing apart. She has to be in that marriage till she dies. And, you know, uh, I do, I, I'm going to, like, because I have a Bihar upbringing, I have to say this, that, you know, it's very, it's, it's a matter of pride when we say that, you know, you will leave this house either in a doli or an arti. So, you know, you leave your home either to go to your husband's house or you just go die. You know, there is no other option. You cannot leave the house otherwise. And it, it, it is sort of said with a lot of pride that this is what women are supposed to do. For me, I keep trying to bring in the lover or whoever else she finds consolation with as an ally. Because I feel that society so clips the wings of women that by themselves, even if they're completely capable, they feel hollow. We have disempowered a woman to the, to the extent that she's afraid of moving out of a place which she knows is toxic. And therefore, she reaches out for an ally. And the ally could be another friend. It could be an older uh, widowed aunt. It could be anybody. But she mm. is looking for an ally who can, and, you know, in that, and I try to show that that ally who, mm. you know, who actually does not have any commitment to her, you know, per se, is more important to her than the husband who, you know, who she's supposed to be tied to for life. And these are the kind of realities that I want to bring out. That, and let me also tell you that it's not only in my books. In real life, if you go into rural Bengal or you go into rural India anywhere, we have women who've been left behind by their husbands. We have uh, widows. We have women who, you know, who were supposed to get married and, you know, didn't, didn't get married. And then, you know, once the marriage broke, then, you know, she's sort of left on the shelf. And all these women have made real successes of their life, not monetary success as we are trained to look at it, but in terms of self-actualization, in terms of self-realization, they are highly successful, you know. So it's not just in my stories, but in real life, we see so many women who are actually icons for having, uh, you know, led the life that they were dished. And that's what I want to try and talk about. Yes, uh, if there is a lover, so be it. I mean, let her have fun too. Why should we have all the fun? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, yeah, that was, um, that. that is, I mean, it is, I suppose, a form of emancipation is what, uh, what I gather from what you've just said. Uh, we've just time for one, uh, one or two questions. My la it's almost my last question. And this is for you, Madhavi. Uh, uh, you know, uh, today we are in the age of internet. I just finished watching a movie called The Tinder Swindler, where I actually understood how Tinder works. You know, it wasn't there when I was probably needed it, you know, um, but um, it's there today. And it seems to me that the internet is a double edged sword. You know, while there are these dating apps and matrimonial websites which further the interests of those 
seeking to connect with the right partners, looking for companionship, etc. The anonymity of Tinder directs very damaging attention through the despicable trolling of, say, gay men, lesbians, intercaste, interfaith couples, older women seeking to assuage their loneliness, etc. All of these are just desires. There's, you know, but they get a lot of denigratory attention. Given that this is the mood of the times, my question is, is love today an acceptable or a forbidden emotion? If you want to change the word love to the one that you prefer, desire, you're free to do that. Thanks, uh, Madhvi. I mean, this might this question might be wasted on me since I really know nothing about the online world. I'm one of those Luddites who's not on any social media and never will be. And I know nothing about any of these things. You know, I know about the dating apps, but I know nothing about how they work. But I think your question is, uh, is, is, uh, does not really require technical knowledge, I guess, of, of the dating apps. Uh, because your question really is, are they giving rise to new kinds of lonelinesses and hollownesses? Or have these always been there? And they're just finding a new version now or a new, new outlet. Um, and I think not only are they finding, uh, not, I don't think it's a new version. I think there's always been shame attached to sexuality or sexual desire. Uh, there's always been taboo attached. There's always been uh, lines drawn for us um, you know, not to cross or to cross. And those lines and restrictions and taboos have always been there. The idea of shaming someone for having desire has always been there. Uh, what perhaps it is doing now, uh, with the un this is my general animus against the online medium, is that it is separating a little bit the idea of consequence from action. Um, and so, you know, if you sort of start shaming somebody, um, if you were doing it in the pre-internet era, uh, everyone would know who you are and would have to be a sort of face-to-face -face conversation yeah. or at least an epistolary conversation or something with some kind of physical tangibility. Um, but now, of course, you're free to adopt whatever pseudonyms you want and rail and rant against whoever. And depending on your political affiliation, you either get elevated and promoted and patted on the back or, you know, you don't, uh, I mean, you don't get thrown into jail. You get thrown into jail, actually, for expressing any kind of desire that the status quo does not accept. Um, so I, I do think that is the difference that I can point to. I don't think the actions themselves or the emotions themselves have changed. I think the way in which consequence is calculated uh, has just become much, much more anonymous and much, much more, therefore, I think, self-righteous mm. and, uh, and passive. I mean, all these things, I think, weirdly enough, huddle together around the online medium, that you're not, that you can just sort of sit back and shoot off whatever you want uh, without consequence, uh, but that also emboldens you to be more self-righteous in your denigration and more self-righteous in your accusation. So it just sort of feels that this has just given rise to the worst of human instincts, our um, sort of moralism, our judgmentalism, our uh, tendency to shame people, especially around ideas of desire, um, seems to me much, much worse right now. Thank you. It seems to me from your answer that, you know, desire, there has always been. Nandita, you'd like to say something? I just wanted to add that, you know, this has always been there. But, you know, our social privilege, you know, uh, kept us in a bubble where we were not exposed to this. And social media breaks that bubble. So, you know, the whole world is at you. That's the only difference. But we know that we live in this world. Otherwise, we wouldn't be living in this, you know, this kind of a rapist society that we live in. So it it, it has always been there. We have not seen it, is, is, yeah. is my opinion, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I would uh, sort of agree because I think from Madhvi's answer and from your comment, it seems like there has always been an open season on desire. And it will continue. And it is perhaps this that, you know, makes the entire, you know, range of love stories, romances, films, and, uh, you know, the, the talk and conversation around it so interesting. Um, I, we have, we've run out of time now. Of course, like the best conversations, this has opened up a whole more range of questions. And I hope we'll have the chance to discuss them another day. 
But in the meanwhile, a big thank you to you all and especially to the Prabha Khetan Foundation for organizing this evening talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, you. Madhavi. And thank you to all my fellow panelists. It was very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We have come almost to the end of today's session. But before we wind up, on behalf of the Foundation, I would like to thank Anukriti Upadhyay, Jahnavi Barwa, Madhavi Menon, Nandita Bose, along with Madhavi S. Mahadevan for this session. I would also like to show my gratitude to our presenter, Sri Cement Limited. Last but not the least, I would also like to thank the audience and the patrons without whom such sessions would not have been possible. Thank you. <laughs>